Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome everybody here tonight. Um, before I uh, get to the business of the evening, introduce our very distinguished guest here. I just got a few housekeeping notices for people who are in the building with us tonight. Uh, obviously, we're in the IHRC bookshop. Everything tonight is 15% off, so please make use of this generous discount tonight. Um, we actually have a new set of publications from IHRC itself, Bibliographical Discourse Analysis. Uh, it's a four-volume set uh, looking at the Western academic perspective on Islam, Muslims and Islamic countries by Professor Amelie. From 1949 to 2009, I really highly recommend this. Uh, it's not four volumes of text, it's a huge bibliography within that, but it's categorised and it provides an overview and insight into how academic perceptions have changed about Islam and Muslims since the end of the Second World War and importantly how that may fit in in terms of a trickle down between the academia and the academy, uh, the political elites, the media and society as a whole. Uh, obviously tonight we're here to uh, talk about the work of Professor Grosfogel, but uh, if you're around next month we also have an author event on 16th of January with the translators of this book by Mullah Mohsin Faith Bashani, Spiritual <coughs> Mysteries and Ethical <coughs> Secrets, uh, which is published by the Islamic College of Advanced Studies. Uh, the translators, uh, Amin and Lois and Nazmina Virji, uh, will be here to talk about the project and the depth of it and so on. Um, those of you who are tweeting, either within the building or who are watching online, then the hashtag is Islamophobia, but also please remember to put at IHRC so the Twitter sphere knows we're all here. Okay, so moving on to tonight. It's really a great honour to introduce my friend and uh, mentor for the last few years, <laughs> Professor Roman Grossfogel. If I introduce him properly, it will be an hour at least, so I'm going to give a very brief introduction and I hope you'll understand from what he has to say, the depth <coughs> of his work. He's one of the leading decolonial thinkers and academics of, of this time. He's Associate Professor uh, at the Ethnic Studies Department at the University of California, Berkeley. He's been instrumental in setting up uh, various decolonial projects uh, around the world, including the Decoloniality Network in Europe. He's also the founder of the Critical Muslim Studies Summer School and other such projects, which I think he can talk about a little bit later on as well, and we can, can see them online as well. He's uh, written several books, many, many articles. One of the books I can refer to is Colonial Subjects by California University Press. Uh, some of the works that he has, some of the articles he's published are published in the journal Human Architecture, a journal of sociology and self-knowledge, and we have these in store and online, on our online shop, on, which has been uh, revamped and relaunched, so anybody watching outside can go to shop.ihrc.org. Uh, some of the articles he's written include Othering Islam, Historicizing Antisemitism, Decolonizing the University and Practicing Plurality, and Islam from Phobia to Understanding. So, Tonight's topic is the never-ending, recurring, uh, forever argued about question. Is Islamophobia a form of racism? With the subtitle. <coughs> From the history of our unbeliefs to find out the zone of being and the zone of non-being. So I think without further ado. Um, thank you very much, uh, Al Sumer Ali. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. And I want to thank very much also to the Islamic Human Rights Commission for uh, this invitation to share with you. Um, I would like to um, also thank all of you who are present here tonight and those who are probably online listening to, to the event. Um, I, I just very briefly wanted to show a few pages here. One <coughs> is this the colonial, uh, this Global Dialogues webpage. If we go a little down, you can see that we have there, uh, there are three summer schools uh, going on in Europe that we have organized. One is in Amsterdam, and it's a Black Europe Summer School, focused on questions of, uh, oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, the Black Euro Summer School in Amsterdam. The three are in the summer, ju between June and July. You can go to this webpage called dialogoglobal.com. It's in Spanish, Dialogo Global, like in English, global. So it's dialogoglobal.com. 
you go to that web page you could get uh, these three schools you click here you click here you click here and you will see uh, the different schools you click in Amsterdam you will see there <coughs> the, the black Europe summer school uh, here you have it uh, and a uh, link to the colonial black movements in Europe and then if you go back uh, and click let's say the one in Granada Spain of which Arsu Merali is a professor there too you see the critical Muslim stu studies the colonial struggles theology of liberation and Islamic revival this is in Granada Spain uh, and there is another one in a uh, in Barcelona, you go back to that web page, you put Barcelona, and you have this one called Decolonizing Knowledge and Power uh, Summer School. Uh, also, in uh, this is in, in Barcelona. These are three summer schools linked to the project of decoloniality Europe. There is also a, another page as part of this project that is called a, Translation.com. Uh, this is the colonial translation.com. Okay, uh, let me move it such a way. Okay, so you have here uh, this web page deals with translation among the colonial movements. So you want to know, you don't read French, you want to know about the decolonial movements in France. You go to this web page and you get translation of the indigenous, let's say, you, you, you know English, right, as a language. So you click English here, okay, and there you got the party of the indigenous of the republic in France. There's a long list of essays there, for example, okay, and there are other movements, you, go, you scroll the page down that you could see, you know, and read, okay. Uh, to get to know each other because part of the barriers is also the, la the linguistic barrier. That's why this was created too. Anyway, just to introduce a few projects. No? There is a web page also, uh, there is also a, a listserv. So if we can get the email, a list, if, you, if someone can take a paper, you know, with people can put their names and emails, uh, you can get connected with the decolonial, the, 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 the listserv, you can get emails and think about the events and things like that going on across Europe. So there are movements in Germany, in the Netherlands, the Black <coughs> Dutch movement in the Netherlands, the indigenous of the Republic in France, which are mostly blacks and Arab Muslims. Uh, there are also Roma people movements, there are different movements across Europe, including the, human, the Islamic Human Rights Commission here and so on. So this is a uh, part of a global network calling for decolonizing Europe. Uh, so having said this, the, the topic of today is a topic that is a hot issue in Europe today, which is, is Islamophobia a form of racism? Okay, and this is a hot issue because you have today a, 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 the rise of Islamophobia in a strong way all over the world but specifically in Europe, it's be, it has become, you know, very, very strong, you know, the Islamophobic discourses in the last 10 years. Uh, I don't want to go into the history of recent history because it's, it's a, it's, we know already the recent history. And we, what I want to basically discuss today is historical issues of Islamophobia in the long durée and I would like to discuss today also uh, issues related to the concept of racism uh, to then um, have a significant discussion about if it's, is, is Islamophobia a form of racism or not okay? <coughs> you have in Europe today a, a struggle because there are countries like France that oppose to call Islamophobia a form of racism okay and they oppose to have at the level of the European community a, a, a long, you know, as, a de, as part of the definition of racism to include Islamophobia. They depart from the idea that racism is mainly color racism. Okay? 
This is the main definition. And therefore, since Muslim people are of different colors, then there's no racism against Muslims. This is the, the argument raised by, by the French government. Okay? And there is a resistance, not only the French government, you could see this across, but the French government have been especially active in blocking the possibility of naming Islamophobia a form of racism. Uh, now, the question is, what is racism? This is a fundamental question, because in fact, the question uh, if Islamophobia is a form of racism or not requires a previous discussion about what exactly is racism, okay? If not, we are just debating about uh, semantics, you see, and not going in depth into a conceptual definition and clarity, okay? So uh, let me start by talking a little about, uh, by the way, I gave a very detailed talk yesterday that you can see in the page of the Islamic Human Rights Commission in, the, in Facebook. If you go to Facebook today, you scroll down a little, they put online my talk yesterday here, and I asked to please record it because I went into a lot of detail of the history of Al-Andalus and the destruction of Al-Andalus and the significance of Al-Andalus for the discussions we're having today. Uh, that is the colonization of what, is, what today we call the South of Spain when it was Islamic territory and the significance of that to many things happening today. I went into historical detail, I cannot do that today, but if you're interested in these topics, you could check my talk yesterday, it's online, and, and, and listen to that one, okay? So today I'm going to go back to that history, but with less detail than what I did yesterday, because I wanna move on into more the conceptual theoretical issues, okay? So the first thing we need to, to talk about is uh, how how um, you have when in fact you know, what were what happened in the process of the conquest of Al Andalus in the 15th century, okay? <laughs> uh, and the relationship between that, that the conquest of Al Andalus and the conquest of the Americas, okay, and and try to look at the interrelation between the two because what I want to do is to historicize when exactly you have the emergence of racism okay in 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 the in the world okay because before 14 I want to make a strong claim here that before 1492 there were a lot of problems there was a lot of conflicts in many parts of the world okay I'm not romanticizing the past but the forms of classifying population were not done along the, the question of uh, inferiorizing human beings below the line of the human. That is, the animalization of human beings okay, below the line of the human is a modern phenomenon. This is something I want to claim strongly. Uh, this is a very <coughs> controversial issue because in Eurocentric historiography, and Eurocentric narratives. Uh, it's very uh, uh, common to have what I call abstract universals. That, what, that, what I mean by abstract universals is you take a term and make it transhistorical, okay? So you talk about slavery and you say, oh, slavery, oh, you know, is there since Adam and Eve, okay? And you make it a transhistorical phenomenon. Oh, racism, oh, it's there since Adam and Eve. Okay, uh, any term you take it and push it back in history in transhistorical ways that is without historicizing when at one moment in time under weak condition this phenomenon emerge. Okay, and they try to flatten down a homogenized history because, in my opinion, it's a way of uh, ideologically. Uh, reducing the responsibility of the West in the formation of racial, modern racial slavery, in the formation of racism as a, as a way of classifying populations, socially speaking, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and it's very easy to have Eurocentric historiography now, it's very common, to basically 
extrapolate into the past everything that you see today, okay? And so, after all, we're not that bad, okay? Because, in fact, if you want to talk about slavery, oh, the Muslims were the worst, okay? <laughs> and if you want to go back, I mean, look at, look at the, and, and so it basically, you know, and when you hear speaking, I mean, now I'm being ironical, it, it sounds as if, you know, they were bringing Africans to do a Caribbean cruise, okay, uh, you know, for, for vacation in the Caribbean, okay? When you hear them, it's like underplaying the atrocities and the horror of, of the history of slavery, okay? And blaming the Muslims, okay, the Muslim world and for a, a racial slavery. Well, first of all, you need to historicize these things. The first thing you need to know is that before 1492, slavery was not racial, okay, to begin with. I'm not defending any form of slavery, okay, don't get me wrong, okay, I criticize any form of slavery, but we need to say that first, it was not racial, okay. Second, a lot of what we call slavery was not also a, a, a commercial enterprise, okay. In many places, like Roman Empire or the Greeks or in the Muslim civilization, it was not necessarily an enterprise of buying and selling slaves and things like that, okay? It was basically people capturing wars, okay, that were then as part of prisoner, they were enslaved. But, for example, there were, in the Islamic world, there were things like rights to slaves, in which you could be born slave and end up being a sultan. Okay, how could you, how would that happen in, you know, uh, if it's racial slavery, you see? So something has happened in there when you have someone being born slave and becoming a sultan, sultan you see? Uh, that, uh, you need to account, we cannot, my critique to Eurocentrism is this abstract universals that run across history and in a, with sweeping arguments without historicizing the different social systems that existed across history and try to make sense of different uh, uh, processes, such as slavery or whatever, in its own uh, uh, social systemic context. And so I'm saying this just to, uh, to say that I am, in my position, I'm highly critical of these uh, transhistorical universal abstract statements that basically make sweeping arguments about everything as a way to basically diminish the West, you know, the responsibility of the West into the world we're living today, okay? And basically what this revisionist historian tried to do is basically to blame the Chinese or to blame the Muslim or to blame someone else. And after all, the, we, the West, we just did the same thing everybody was doing before. We were not doing anything different, you know? So it's a kind of innocent white history that we need to question, okay? Because in fact, there is an agenda in doing that, okay? In not that I'm going to praise or to say that in the past, you know, a, a romantic view of the past, we have to have a critical view of the past too. But what we cannot do is flatten down history, homogenize everything, and then, uh, you know, coming up with these sweeping statements that are basically putting the responsibility of the world we live today in elsewhere, except the West, okay? Elsewhere. Where? In the hands of uh, the Chinese or the Muslims or the Ottomans or, you know, someone else, okay? And uh, so, having said that, I want to go back to the late 15th century Andalusia. Here we have the Catholic monarchy coming and conquering in what we call today settler colonialism, taking over the land in Andalusia, destroying the Islamic political power or authority, and imposing a new form or a new regime in which you have one identity, one religion, one state, okay? In Andalusia, anybody who knows a little of the history, you know that Islamic political authority 
had a different take. That is, you have a one political authority with a multiplicity of identities and a recognition and coexistence of multiple spiritualities, respected not only in their practices, but including in their rights. There were rights, okay, to a uh, people like Jews, Jewish, and Catholics uh, who were in Islamic territory. They have rights recognized. They have even representation in the political authorities uh, with some political power in the, in the, in the process in, more, in a lot of these sultanates that existed in Andalusia. Uh, what the Catholic monarchy imposed was the idea of a, a, they, when they came and colonized the territories, they imposed a different logic of one state, one identity, one religion. And anybody who didn't fit that were either expelled or killed, okay? And, and everywhere they went, okay? Everywhere they colonized in the south of Spain, they imposed this structure. Here you have the, the formation of the early formation, what we call today the nation state, okay? The idea, this fictional idea that the identity of a whole population should correspond to the identity of a state, okay? And I'm saying it's a fictional idea for reasons I don't, I don't think I need to explain here, you know, that the diversity of identities, people, etc., exists inside many nation states around the world. But this structure called nation state is a modern colonial structure that has created more problems than solution everywhere it, it's, it's institutionalized, okay? Because it's basically coming with this logic that goes back to the Spanish monarchy of imposing one identity, one state, one spirituality that becomes hegemon in the space and the others become subalternized or inferiorized, okay? So, uh, basically, having said this, we need to do a little story here just to, 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 to contextualize the things I'm going to say. First, let me say that when the Spanish monarchy, Catholic monarchy conquer territories in Al-Andalus, they uh, not only impose this logic, but they came with a notion that uh, became very significant, that I will call it a proto-racist notion. It's not yet fully racist for reasons I'm going to explain in a second, but it, they, they spoke about purity of blood. That is, wherever they went, they went and imposed a logic of purity of blood. They use this term in the late 15th century, okay? The term purity of blood. What they meant by this was not exactly what we think of it today. What they meant by this was we need to know if the population we are conquering are faking conversion, okay? Because those who are not accepting conversion, they're killed, they are expropriated from the land, they will bring settler colonial subjects from elsewhere of the Catholic uh, kingdom to occupy the land. You see, sound familiar? It's, you know, quite similar to what happened in, in Israel today, okay, with Palestinians, with settler colonialism. And, and so what, they were doing this already in the 15th century, expelling Muslim and Jews from the land, taking over the land, killing many of them, and expelling them out of the peninsula, okay? We have to say this because a lot of the historiography today is so much, is so Islamophobic and so Eurocentric that we live on, talking about transhistorical argument, we live under this Orientalist, Zionist historiography that tells you that the conflict in the Middle East is a, is a, is a conflict of more than a thousand years between Jews and Muslims, okay? And, and then you make it, again, a trans-historical, universal issue, when in fact we know that the problem today uh, in, uh, in Palestine is a, is a colonial racial problem. It has nothing to do with the relation between Muslims and Jews. As a matter of fact, historically, it's inaccurate to say that Jews and Muslims were having all this conflict when we know that Jews were escaping Catholic, Christian, Protestant Europe from pogroms, you know, throughout all 
many centuries, where did they go? They go to Islamic territories because in Islamic territories, their rights were recognized and respected. You see, and they were escaping. Where did they go? They went to Islamic territories. Why? Because they have good relation or better relation than what they had with the Christian world. And so many of them escaped to Al-Andalus or to parts of North Africa when they were finally destroyed Al-Andalus. They were being uh, escaping to the Muslim territory. So this thing about Muslim Jews conflict and things like this, this is a, a construction, a recent construction to make us believe that there's some kind of inherent eternal nature there that has been there forever, okay? And it's a way of concealing the history of colonialism and racism going on today in Palestine. So, uh, and the exercise of Israelis uh, colonial uh, rule over the territory of Palestine. So this is something that uh, is very typical. That's why I oppose this abstract universal and this transhistorical argument. They always come with some kind of agenda behind them, you know, to basically diminish responsibility in what they're doing, okay? That's why, that's why I, I begin with this critique. Uh, now, you have this purity of blood. What was purity of blood there in that context? Purity of blood meant, basically, I want to know the genealogy of your family so that I want, if you have, for example, a father, mother, or grandparents, or parents, whatever, that are Jews or Muslim, I'm going to surveil you. I'm, I'm talking about the, the Spanish uh, Christian monarchy. The, I want to surveil you to make sure you're not faking conversion. So I'm going to check on you because you're a suspect if you happen to be a, a son or a daughter of parents who happen to be Jews or Muslim, okay? So they will surveil you. That's the purity of blood notion. I'm saying proto-racist because still it's not fully racist for reasons I'm going to say in a minute. Now, they were surveilling this using this notion. Now, in uh, 1490, 1491, when you have the first meeting between Christopher Columbus and the king and the queen of Spain, in which Christopher Columbus comes with the with the uh, Indian Enterprise, that was the project called, the Indian Enterprise. Uh, in this, when he proposed the project, the reaction of the queen, Queen El uh, 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 Elizabeth, was to say, hey, this is great, we're going to pursue this, but first, we need to destroy the last remaining bastion of an Andalus, that is the Sultanate of Granada, okay? Once we unify the territory, okay, under one state, one rule, one identity, one religion, then we go abroad and do all these other things, okay? But first, we need to put together, finish up with what we started here. So this is significant because we usually talk about these histories disentangled from each other, when in fact they were thought as step one, step two, step three. Okay, but the, we usually think of them as things that happen fragmented, you know, with no relation among them. Among them, but they are strictly related because they were. That's the rea That's why the queen say, "Hey, we'll do it." But first step is this, and then second step is that. Okay, so in January second, fourteen ninety two, you have the fall of Granada. And Christopher Columbus is outside Granada in a, in a town called Santa Fe, waiting for the fall of Granada to then go immediately and talk with the king and the queen and bring back the plan, you see? January 11, 1492, you have the meeting between the king and the queen with Christopher Columbus in Alhambra. Okay, you have gone to Granada, you know, Alhambra, the, the palace or the territory where you have the Islamic political authority in Granada. Uh, is today a tourist site, uh, considered one of the, uh, how do you say in English, one of the mar maravillas, del, una de las siete maravillas del universo, del universo, one of the seven wonders of the, of the planet. But anyway, um, so you have a, in the, a meeting there in Granada where the queen said, okay, we, now we're ready, here are the resources, here is the authority, go ahead, okay? Now, 
uh, we have to say that there were violations of the agreements between the Muslim and the Christian very fast, okay? One of the first violations of the capitulation, it was called capitulation, you say in English capitulation? There were capitulations between the king, the queen, with, uh, with the, the Islamic uh, sultanate, okay, in, in the defeat of Granada. And one of them was the respect of the, of the uh, property and a, a, a spirituality of Muslim and Jews in the territory. Well, in February 1492, they expelled the Jews from the territory, okay? A month later, okay? They were already expelling the Jews. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the Muslims were very fast expropriated from land, expropriated from access to resources, etc. okay? I cannot go into all that history, but the point is that uh, by October 12th of the same year, 1492, Columbus arrived to the Americas. I'm using terms here, problematic terms, because that place that we call today the Americas is not the Americas, okay? It was called differently by indigenous people over there, okay? I'm using these terms just for the sake of communication. Same thing when I say Islamic Spain. That was not Islamic Spain, that was Al-Andalus, okay? It was another, had another, a different name, a different political structure, etc. But for reasons of communication, given that we already been, you know, we're in the modern colonial world and we think of these geographies with the names that they impose, we, we cannot communicate otherwise, okay? So for a shorthand, I'm using these terms, but keep in mind that this is not the names that were used at the time, okay? Uh, so he arrived in the American particular to in the Caribbean and uh, I'm now following some of the insights of the work of Nelson Maldonado Torres, who calls for uh, how Columbus, the first day he arrived and stepped out of the boat, he comes back to the boat and put in the diary, my God, these are people without religion, okay? This is very significant because people without religion, if you think about it now, you might think that he's talking about, oh, is that he's saying they're atheists, okay? If you use this term in the 21st century, you say, oh, they're atheists. No, in the late 15th century, when you say people without religion, in the Christian imaginary of the time, okay, it has a different connotation, okay? When you say these people have no religion, it means the following, at the time, in Christian imaginary, all human beings have religion. They have God or gods. They might have their own one. We might kill each other about it. But the humanity of the other is not in question because at the time, everybody has religion. Everybody that is a human being. But here we have people, this guy has been out of the boat, I don't know, an hour, and he's already concluding that these are people without religion. This is the, the classification he used. And he's saying, what he means with that is that people without religion means they have no God, and if they have no God, that means they have no soul. And if they have no soul, then these have to be a species from nature. They have to be like cows, like horses, like monkeys, or something like that. Because human beings have religion. They have God, God, the wrong one, we might kill each other about it, but they have a religion because they have soul. But these people have no religion, that means they have no soul. And if they have no soul, they are like animals, okay? Look, watch this carefully because here, he didn't say they are black, okay? Color racism was not yet there. Keep that in mind, please. Because we, part of what I'm trying to argue is that there are different ways to mark racism. One of them is color racism, but it's not the only one, okay? And what I'm trying to argue is that then if that's the case, then what is racism? And I wanna go into a definition of racism that is not bounded by the particular manifestation it might have in different places, okay? So in different colonial histories, okay? So he said, People, the first classification is people with religion, people without religion. And this is the first classification which you have the classification of whole population based 
on the dehumanization of the population below the line of the human, okay? Where you have all these populations that are being classified below the line of the human because they have no soul. They are like animals, therefore, it's not a sin in the eyes of God to enslave them. Not a sin in the eyes of God to use them, you know, forcibly into a labor process because it's like having a cow or, you know, a horse or something like that, okay? So there's no problem in doing this. Uh, now, this opened up a whole debate, okay, in Europe at the time. Between 1492 all the way till 1552, there was a huge debate, and I'm saying in Europe at the time, because even though it was concentrated, the debate was concentrated in Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal, Spain, it was debated in many other parts of Europe because at the time, the, the, the language of writing was Latin. And so all these debates were written in Latin and was being read in Germany, it was being read in France, it was being read here in England, in many places around Europe, through the networks of the church, okay? So the debate was not just an Iberian Peninsula debate, it was a European debate. And the debate was about, okay, who are these people we encounter over there, and do they have a soul or not? Okay, what's going on here? And this is the debate. Now, the Spanish Empire very early on have decided in practice that they, they have no soul, we are enslaving them, and they immediately put them to work under forced labor in slavery, okay? Now, uh, this debate was, there was a debate, but there were people inside Europe asking the question, aren't we making a mistake? Because if these people have a soul, we might be committing a sin in the eyes of God, you know? And there were also people in the America from the church itself, like priests and others that were already making questions to you. Hey, we are doing abuses here. And, you know, what if these people have a soul? We're going to end up in hell because these people might have a soul. So what's going on here? So there was this debate going on, okay? And so the debate went on. Finally, the Pope, in 1537, make a decree saying these people have, he used the term, a, these people have a soul, but it's an animal soul. He used the term animal soul, okay? And which is similar to the idea, I mean, that these are empty land. The, the idea of empty land that we hear today, sound familiar in the Zionist project? It was coined there in the 16th century, okay? And you could see very clearly in the debate that finally went through in 1552 in the school of Salamanca between Bartolomé de las Casas and Gines Sepúlveda, okay? I know you heard about this debate. It's a major modern colonial racial debate because it has an impact in the new European world system that was created after 1492. Because in this debate, because the Pope made this decree, you see, the, in Spain, there was this instability, okay, what are we going to do now? You know, why, you know, they have, he say he has a soul, they have a soul, but they might, it's an animal-like soul, so what is this? Maybe it's a sin, you know, so the ambiguity was there. So was this debate finally held in the Spanish Empire, because at the time, the authority of knowledge was in the hands of the church, okay? So they put it in the hands of the church to decide, okay, what is going on here? What are we going to do about this? And the debate was the following. Gine Sepúlveda argue that these people are, have no soul. Therefore, they're like animals. So it's not in the, a sin in the eyes of God to enslave them. And he will say, the arguments he will use, which is significant, is that uh, the, the, the example of the, of the best uh, evidence we have that they have no soul is that they have no notion of private property and they have no notion of trade and commerce. Okay? These people live in collective societies where they distribute their, their, their things in, in a free way 
you know, and, and so they don't have private property nor trade or commerce. So these people are like animals, okay? That was the evidence. It was already a theological debate with, with a capitalistic I ideology already there, okay? Which is interesting. But then you have Las Casas who came and said, okay, these people have a soul, but they are, they are like childs. That is, they, they are still immature. So they are barbarians that need to be Christianized. That was the position of Las Casas, okay? Barbarians need to be Christianized. They have a soul, but they're like child, and to develop their, their soul into maturity, we need to Christianize them. So this was the debate. Now, these two positions will run for the next 450 years, 500 years, okay? Because you have, on one side, <coughs> what today we call biological racism. And it's the position of Las Casas. And on the other side, you have what today we call cultural racism, which, I'm sorry, biological racism is the position of Sepúlveda. Okay, these people have no soul, they're like animals. Cultural racism is the position of Las Casas. These people are barbarians and need to be Christianized. They are inferior culturally to us. Okay? So here you have the two major discourses of Western imperialism for the next several hundred years, okay? And you will see these two discourses, the same empire using the two against two different people or, or the, one empire emphasizing one of the, the other. You will see this, this uh, the entanglement of these two discourses in complex ways in the British Empire, French Empire, Dutch Empire, all these empires, okay? But the important thing is how in the 19th century, you have the secularization of these narratives when the authority of knowledge passed from Christian theology to scientificism in the 19th century. And now you have the discourse of Sepúlveda in which people without soul okay, turn into people without the DNA. It's a secularization of the same narrative, okay, from not having soul to not having DNA. That's from a, a, a discourse, a racist discourse, coin or frame in theological arguments to a racist discourse or frame in, in scientific arguments, okay? And then you have Las Casas from barbarians that need to be Christianized in the 19th century turned into a primitive that need to be civilized, okay? So you have here the natural sciences coining the term from people without soul to people without the DNA, and the social sciences coining the term from barbarians to be Christianized to primitive to be civilized. So you have the two sciences there, you know, working together in the inferiorization of the people around the world. Now, uh, you have, in the 17th century, you have the uh, epistemic, ep an epistemic revolution, okay? I would call it a war historical event. And that's the emergence of René Descartes and Cartesianism, okay? Cartesianism, René Descartes, he coined this phrase called, where he says, I think, therefore I exist, okay? Now, this term, I, exist, theref I, ex I think, therefore I exist, what it, he meant by this I, who is this I, is not clear in Descartes, it's not clear. He doesn't say, who is this I? But what he's doing now is taking the attributes of the Christian God and secularizing the attributes of the Christian God into, a, into the, this I, okay? And saying basically that this I has a God I view and that this I is able to produce a knowledge that is valid beyond time and space. All the attributes of the Christian God now become secularized into this I, okay? 
And now this eye is able to produce a knowledge godlike. Okay? And it's able to produce a knowledge that is beyond time and space, universal in, in the sense that it's the point of view of all points of view. Okay? It's beyond any particularism. So it's a god eye view. It's floating somewhere in the air. The mind is floating in the air and is able to produce a knowledge that is valid for all the knowledges in the world. Okay? Now, the condition of possibility of making that claim of a God eye, of, of this eye that can produce a God eye view, a knowledge that is equivalent to the Christian God knowledge, okay, is he has two things. The first one is dualism. He has to split the head from the body. He has to behead the, the, the thinkers. Because what happens if the head is in a body? If the head is in a body, then you're a human being with limits. You're not God. I'm sorry to tell you. You are bounded by your existence. You cannot claim that you're God-like. Okay, that's the first thing you need to, so the dualism there is a condition of possibility for him to make this claim of a God eye view. Because if he doesn't have dualism, then he cannot make the claim that this eye is able to produce a God-like knowledge. You see? Because if not, then the, if the head is in a body, that means you're a human being and you're bounded by your historical condition and your ex social existence. You're not God, okay? Uh, and you have the, the other condition of possibilities. The, uh, in English, I believe it's syllogicism, syllogistic uh, method, which is that you ask questions as a monologue of the subject within himself, okay, in which you ask questions and answer them until you achieve certitude of knowledge. That's the method that he called for to achieve certitude of knowledge. How do I know that my knowledge is certitude, have certitude? Well, I go into an internal monologue with myself. So he has to delink human beings from this eye, from, from a dialogical and social relation with other human beings in the construction of knowledge. Because what happens if, if that eye produce knowledge in relation with other human beings? socially speaking, then you cannot claim you have a good eye view. Because that means that you're bounded to the society in which you're born. Okay? Now, this claim to, that's why he needs dualism and he needs silo, this syllogicism. To be able to disconnect the mind from the body and the mind from nature, so that the mind's floating elsewhere and not determined by anything particular and then you are like God. You're floating in the air, watching the world, and then you have a God eye view. Okay? And the other thing is this internal dialogue in which this monologue, internal monologue, in which human beings produce knowledge without having dialogue with other human beings. That way, you could claim that you have a God eye view because you're not determined by any kind of social relation with anybody. So you're beyond time and space. The mind is floating elsewhere like God beyond time and space. Okay? Now, this inaugurates a new form of universalism, in which is a universalism that claims to be the point of view of all points of view. This is the kind of universalism that the West has been, you know, claiming. It's the, point, the universalism that is the point of view of all points of view. That is, it's beyond any particular point of view. It's beyond any particularity. Therefore, by making that claim, they're able to produce then the claim that their knowledge is superior to other people in the world because their knowledge is valid for everybody. I don't know if you follow me the logic of the argument here. I call this universalism idolatric universalism because it's the universalism of a God-like or a God-I view that pretends to be God-like. I call it idolatric universalism, okay? Because it's as if they are building a knowledge that is the point of view of God, okay? And that they're going to now uh, use a worldwide as a superior knowledge over other forms of knowledges. 
okay? And the claim is that you, this I is not determined by any particularity, it's not determined by nature, it's not determined by a body, it's not determined by a society, and therefore this I is able to produce a knowledge that is God-like. You see, that is the point of view of all points of view, okay? This is the kind of universalism that is inaugurated by the car. I'm saying that the word historical event because you don't have that kind of a claim anywhere else in the world, okay, up till that time, okay? All the other cosmology, spiritualities in the world, you don't get anybody saying, I am God, or I'm replacing God, I have a god god I view, or I'm, I'm a God-like, or things like that. That will be, in Islamic or Jewish tradition, criticized immediately for idolatry. That will be criticized even in the, in the, not in the Christendom, but in the, in the Christian, early Christian tradition, uh, before it became an ideology of state with the dualism and all of that, it does, it's not there either, because uh, nobody in the planet could be God-like or could be God. God is beyond everybody, okay? And the same thing if you go to indigenous spiritualities, to other places around the world, nobody's making those claims. That's why I'm saying this is a, a war historical event in which you have, for the first time in world history, someone making a claim like this, okay? This idolatric universalism. Now, the question here is, he never say who is this I, and he cannot situate the I, because the moment he situates the I, then he lost the argument. You see, he cannot claim it's a God I view. If you say this is a Western man talking, then it's, it's over, he's not God. Okay, so he had to claim an ambiguity about who is this I and where is he thinking from. So you have philosopher of liberation of Latin America, Enrique Dussel, asking the question, this ego politics of knowledge of Descartes, this, this I that pretends to be beyond any particularity, that is not situated anywhere, that is like, the, like God floating somewhere in heaven, okay, watching the world, you know, from heaven, in which the notion of objectivity is equivalent to neutrality, okay, because it's, it's a God I view, so you have the point of view of all points of view, and therefore you are objective in the sense of neutrality, okay? Uh, why I'm going over the car so much? Because this is the foundation of modern sciences. Modern Eurocentric sciences is founded on this epistemology and these assumptions. The split of subject-object, the pretension that the subject can produce a knowledge Objective in the sense of neutrality, a knowledge that is beyond any point of view, and all etc. etc. This is at the foundation of modern social sciences, the humanities, etc. etc. Okay, this idea is still very much uh, strong, okay, in Western science, especially. I mean, even in people who are critical of Descartes, they reproduce these, these assumptions, okay, in, in the production of knowledge. Now, the question that Enrique Dussel asked, philosopher of liberation in Latin America, is what are the historical and political conditional possibility for someone in the mid 17th century to claim to replace God, okay, and to have all the attributes of the Christian God? What are the conditions possible? Who is this I speaking here? Who is this from which location in the geopolitics of knowledge that is in the in the power relation of the world, okay, and in the body politics of knowledge, from which body, who is this body speaking, okay? So he, he turns and situates the pretension of the card of producing knowledge unsituated. What Dussel does is to situate with this question, okay, who is this person speaking? In which geopolitical location is speaking from and in which body is speaking from? So he's saying, the conditional possibility that I think, therefore I exist, is 150 years of I conquer, therefore I exist. This is the imperial being speaking. This is the Western imperial man speaking. So for someone in the mid 17th century to come and claim a God I view or a God like knowledge, is, and throw away God and the Christian God and say, I am now God, is because something has happened historically, economically, and politically okay, to, to have someone to say something like that. 
okay? And what had happened is that now you have a new world system that have conquered the world and have put at the center in terms of epistemic privilege, Western man, okay? That's why he said, Be behind I think, therefore I am, or therefore I exist of the car, is I conquer, therefore I exist. But I will add something else to, to do so. I will say that behind the I think, therefore I exist, is not only the I think, therefore I conquer, it's not, it's not I conquer, therefore I exist, is I exterminate, therefore I exist. Why I'm saying exterminate? Because you have first the genocide of Muslim people and Jewish people in Al-Andalus, in the conquest of Al-Andalus. You have the genocide of indigenous people in the Americas, okay? You have the genocide of indigenous people in the Americas. And you have the genocide of African people because when the trial of Las Casas and Sepúlveda, when they decide that indigenous people have a soul, they place them in another form of course label called the encomienda, and then they replace the indigenous people from slavery, they replace them with Africans that will do now, will be enslaved in the Americas, okay? So you have this, and you have millions of Africans killed in the voyage that way, and millions killed also in the plantations in the Americas. So you have a fourth genocide. You have the genocide of Jews, genocide of Muslims, genocide of black people, Africans in the Americas, and in the voyage, you have millions killed in the process, okay? And that's when you have now the coexistence of people with soul and without soul, this religious racism, together with color racism, because now with the African captive trade, okay, I don't say slave trade, because there was no slave there waiting in the shores of Africa, I'm here, enslave me, okay? That's another Eurocentric fairy tale, and I invite you to buy the book of Kwame Nimak upstairs. Uh, the, the, it's called the Dutch Atlantic, where he put in question all these things because the Europeans now want to say, oh, they were already in slaves, and all, the only thing, only thing we did was to buy them and bring them to America. There was no slaves in Africa waiting to be in, you know, in the shores there to you know, enslave me. There were captives, they were kidnapped, okay? And brought to the America and enslaved in America. These are human beings kidnapped. This is not that they were, the language itself is a, is a very tricky language when you say, oh, the slave trade, as if they were already slaves over there. You know, like they are already, Africans are slaves. They were already enslaved there and they, they just bought them and brought them here. No, there was no slavery in Africa, okay? And no racial slavery in Africa the way <laughs> is portrayed. There were people that were captured and taken to the Americas to be enslaved. That's another fairy tale that we have in history. I invite you to buy that book that is upstairs of Kwame Nimako, a black Dutch thinker who wrote this book called The Dutch Atlantic, published by Pluto Press. Okay, and uh, this book is really very powerful because it goes into the epistemological, this epistemological question of the language itself. We're using the language of the master to talk about this. You know, we're not even using an alternative language to talk about these things, okay? We're still carrying on with this uh, common sense, you know, like, oh, the slave trade. Wait a minute, were they slaves in Africa? No, they were not slaves. They were captured, kidnapped, okay? And then brought to America to be enslaved. It's a different... <laughs> question here. And so, 